Hi, I'm Nandor Fox Schaefer. I'm creator and writer of Seasons, Lifeline, and Manchild. I'm an award-winning comic book writer there. Uh, and you can find all of my um, work uh, on my Gumroad store, which is foxwellcomics.gumroad.com. And you can also uh, subscribe to my newsletter and my YouTube channel, Foxhole Comics. Uh, you'll find everything that I've worked on, everything I've done through there. So just type in Foxhole Comics and you'll find me. Uh, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we're in for you, the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to another episode of Rapid Fire. The concept is simple. It's 11 questions, about 9 to 15 minutes long, depending on the answers. And we are joined by a very talented creative person in the entertainment industry in this one-on-one -on -one style interview. That's kind of like inside the actor studio, but, you know, with other people than actors. <laughs> but who is our guest today? Our guest today is a, a first-timer on the show, but is talented in his own right. He has created so many amazing comics, but we are talking to the ever-talented Nander Fox Schaefer, creator of and writer of Manchild Issues 1 and 2. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kurt. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to do this rapid-fire interview. <laughs> for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Yeah, so I am an award-winning comic book writer. I've been making comics for about six years now, and I've published uh, four books, which are right here with me on camera, uh, Seasons Volumes 1 and 2, Man Child Issue 1, and Lifeline. So three graphic novels, one single issue, and yeah, now we're funding Man Child Issue 2. And I've been writing comics, making comics for uh, the better part of these last five or six years, and um hoping to continue on with it. So what is Manchild issue two all about then? Actually, what is Manchild about? I should, should ask since that's our- Yeah, Manchild came about through my grieving process after Stan Lee passed away. I wanted to do something as a tribute to him. So this story tells two stories simultaneously, one taking place in the real world with a super nerd named Rufus Boston. And he's like any of us who loves to obsess about comic books and hangs out with his friends at the comic book store and is going to see the new superhero movie, the midnight premiere at the theater. And the other story taking place is Silver Age inspired superhero world where we follow the monarch crier, who's this monarch butterfly type character. He is fighting his arch nemesis in this story who is called Professor Pilgrim. And the mystery behind what Manchild is, how the two stories relate, kind of a commentary on comic book fandom, and also that ideal uh, that we have as, as comic book fans of wanting to be our heroes. Sometimes we shouldn't meet our heroes, though. Exactly. Yeah. That happened to me at a comic convention one time. I met, uh, I met Al from Quantum Leap TV series, and uh, he wouldn't give me two words or, or the time of day for that matter. So. Oh, man. You know, I, I haven't had a bad comic con experience yet, but I've, I've heard some really bad stories. <laughs> what is it about being a writer that maybe is misunderstood to those that you tell them you're a comic writer? Well, I think first, when it comes to like comic writer, I think some people will think that that's not the quintessential meaning of what it means to be a writer, you know, because comics are just, you know, funny books, so to speak. And, and maybe they're not as intensive as like writing a novel or a screenplay. So I think people get the wrong idea when it comes to the amount of time and effort and creativity it takes, collaborative effort it takes to be a comic book writer in that medium, particularly. And then as a writer, it's really important to always uh, be able to schedule yourself. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand just how mentally intensive and how much of a discipline it is to be a writer on a more daily basis because it's all up to you. Everything's up to you, especially in indie comics, going back to just what comics takes when it comes to being a comic book writer, usually you're the one producing everything and putting all your money into it. So there's a business sense to it and a discipline sense to it in terms of time. And then just a creative sense to let your juices like keep flowing despite the day-to-day -day kind of hustle it takes. You mentioned collaboration and that's usually the epitome of, of all comics, unless you can do everything together, like, like the manga cause do, or like yeah. uh, some creators do in, in 
in North America, especially in the indie scene, it seems like you have to be that these days. But who is the, the team that you've collaborated with specifically with Manchild? And we'll talk about Seasons and, of course, Lifeline as well, too, just to kind of get the teams you've worked with in the past. Of course. So Manchild is penciled, inked, and colored by uh, Jay Mazar. He is uh, on board for the entire series. Uh, he did issue one. He's doing issue two. He's a great collaborator. We've really become friends working on this book together, and we really have a great sense of creative sense kind of on the same wavelength. And then our letterer is uh, DC Hopkins. And DC Hopkins is a professional letterer who's worked with Almost every major comic book company, IDW, Boom, Dark Horse, Image, Marvel. And so he's done a lot of great stuff. So seasons, uh, it's just myself and then Anthony Gonzalez-Clark. He does all of the art and the lettering too. For these first two volumes, uh, he did it all. It's just been like a two-man army when it comes to seasons, uh, just me and him. And then for Lifeline, it's a completely different story with that one because I worked with seven different artists from all around the world. Who contributed to each chapter of the story so lifeline just so that makes sense it tells this life story of this character and each chapter takes place in a different decade of this character's life i wanted an artist that could capture each uh, story and each uh, decade that we're uh, involving ourselves in for that so see if i can name them all emily schnall kaden quinn lyndon white scott austin Rin Noen, Erwin Arosa and Patrick Biermeyer all worked on that book. And then Letter Squids did the lettering. It's amazing to see when you get art back, especially with your various comics that you've done, man, and, and we'll talk about Manchild specifically here for this question. What was the scene that you wrote that when you got the art back, it just blew you away? For oh, issues, man. One or two. So with Manchild, there was a specific scene after Rufus finds out that his favorite comic book creator, who's an analog for Stan Lee, his name's Stu Leeds in the book. After he finds out his hero uh, has died, we turn the page. And as we turn the page, we enter the superhero world with the Monarch Crier. And it's this two-page splash. When you open up the comic, um, you have to turn the, the book vertical. So it's a vertical two-page splash. And it's um, meant to kind of give you this sense of Rufus's world has turned upside down so that when you turn the page, the comic itself is like sort of turning upside down and you're entering this whole new world. And it just adds this like tangible effect of not only us switching uh, worlds and switching stories, but also um, just how much of an impact going back to that sense of turning your world upside down and putting that into the comic itself. And when I got the art back for that and the two page splash, it just, it knocked me out. It was so great. So how does one find an artist to fit the styles that you've incorporated, especially with, with Manchild and your other works as well too, because you've, you've gathered multiple artists from many different genres and different areas of expertise, but when you were finding the artist for Manchild, what was it about uh, your artist that just really spoke to you compared to others that you, you have seen? It was definitely a struggle. I, I don't think I had looked uh, this hard for someone that I did for my previous books because uh, I needed someone who could do the real world in, in the present day, but also had a classic style about them where they could do superhero action. And I didn't want to work with two different artists for the two different stories. A lot of communication errors can happen. The more people that are on board for something that is a creative venture. And so I wanted to find someone who could do both. Jay actually had done mostly noir stuff. Uh, on his website, he had some superhero pinups of, of different characters, not uh, any se sequentials really. But I saw like this Ditko-esque, Chris Samney, Mike Allred flavor to his work. It just really spoke to me. When I actually got in contact with him, he was kind of hesitant about working on the book because he didn't feel like his skills were competent enough to do something of this high concept. But I really believed in him and I really believed that he was the perfect guy. And I'm thankful he trusted me enough because I think his work speaks uh, for itself. What is the, the current stage of the campaign and what are you excited about once it's funded? So we are uh, 17 days out from the campaign ending. Uh, we're 62% funded, I believe. Uh, we're just over $2,800 and our goal is $4,500. 
Uh, this has been my strongest campaign yet that I've done in terms of uh, the amount that we've raised in the short amount of time that we have. So I'm really happy about that. When it comes to what we can expect uh, after uh, we get funding and what the book will be, uh, I'm really excited mostly for uh, seeing these variant covers come out because I have some beautiful variant covers by Marco Rudy and Jim Rugg, who, if you don't know who he is, he's a co-host on the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel, which is like my favorite favorite YouTube channel when it comes to talking about process. For the first issue, we had a lot of variant covers and they all turned out perfect. And it was one of the most satisfying aspects of doing this campaign because I've never done variant covers before for any of my previous books. So working with these industry show-stopping artists for this book, Manchild Issues 1 and 2, I can't wait to see how these covers turn out when we print them. Why the need to try variant covers? Was it just something to be uh, a little different than past campaigns or how did that come about? Well, um, I sort of wanted to do something that celebrated the medium and celebrated artists and, and particularly artists that I love their work from superhero comics and from books that I read growing up or books that uh, I had read currently and wanted to kind of add that experience to the crowdfunding campaign because variant covers have always been a really big part of the comic book industry for the last, you know, I'd say a few decades. And so I wanted to put my kind of a hand into the mix and see what I could come up with. And my previous books were all graphic novels and I hadn't done any variant covers for a graphic novel before and I didn't feel like it was financially kind of feasible to do that but with uh, single issues it's just a lot easier to coordinate that and uh, much cheaper and uh, gives people more of a unique experience to get the book that they want and the cover that they want so it's more customizable in that way. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? Wow, um, that is a huge question. Uh, the birth of creativity. We as humans have something to say. When it comes to art and creativity, it's our way of being able to communicate and communicate that and communicate truths and feelings and things that maybe we couldn't articulate on a more conscious or serious level, but we can do uh, subconsciously or, or with our creative talents and we're able to say things we wouldn't normally say, and we were able to resonate with people and, and connect with people in a way that we wouldn't normally connect. And I think creative creativity came from this natural need to communicate and connect with uh, people around us. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? It really came down to reading for me. Being a huge reader that I am, when I started reading novels and I started reading books, I started to notice how I would think about these stories and think about what I was reading on a more personal level. It made me sort of reflect on my own life and people around me and the experiences that people had gone through. And all of that was through words, which is, you know, through, through language. And I think being able to read so much at an early age and really being a sponge for science fiction novels and uh, biographies and books like that, it really kind of helped me see how language can change you as a person. And also, uh, I'm a musician. Music is sort of a universal language. You can see it that way. And so when I would play music in my band that I'm in, and see how it affects people. It was like we're communicating on this level, unspoken language, so to speak, always really stuck with me going back to connecting. And I think language is all about connecting with people. So what's your band's name? Its name uh, is Heroics. I'm the drummer and my brother is the the singer and, and we actually have an album out that people can listen to. So definitely check it out. So Heroics, uh, it's called Roll Into Town. You can find it on Basecamp, uh, I believe. Some music videos on YouTube. I believe we're also on Spotify and iTunes. So yeah, just type in uh, Heroics Roll Into Town and you will find us. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? The person that I always go back to, and it's sort of probably, a, it might be a cheap answer in some respects or, or just an easy answer, but I choose him because he opened my sense of creativity and inspired me to be a creator. And that would be George Lucas. Also, as I got older and learned more about financial struggles and creative struggles and just practical struggles that he went through to 
get a movie like Star Wars off the ground, kind of change the whole landscape of how we view blockbusters and science fiction and, and space fantasy. For someone who was an indie filmmaker, I, I relate to that because I'm an indie creator, just like George Lucas was. And for someone to be able to get something like that off the ground when a lot of people didn't believe in what he was doing or understand what he was doing, I always go back to that and find a lot of uh, relatability and comfort in knowing that it just takes that one person to continue on with their vision and not compromising and, and doing their best to work with who they can and to make something that's really special. So uh, yeah, I go back to him. From a professional standpoint, we see what you have created, of course, with these four amazing graphic novels, five with issue two of Manchild coming out, especially on Kickstarter currently. So go support it in the link in the lower third of his name below. So professionally, you're successful in, in that regard, creating amazing works, and you'll continue to make amazing works in the future. Do you consider yourself personally successful, though? That is a really hard question because from the outside looking in, it definitely looks like I'm being successful in the books that I'm making. I have this goal in mind of, of course, writing for Marvel or DC or, or Dark Horse. While I feel like I've been successful on a few fronts and kind of getting my name out there and my books out there, I don't feel like I've made it to where I want to be. I don't feel like I'm as personally successful as I would prefer to be in my goals and, and what I want. I definitely better off than where I used to be. And so um, it's sort of a give and take and you have to look at the pros and cons, but I think overall, I wish I was a little further than where I am. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? I uh, beat myself up for a while <laughs> until it gets nauseating to continue to beat yourself up and you start wasting time on that. And then I move on. What I try to do in a more realistic way and without being sarcastic is I try to look at what went wrong, kind of strategize how to avoid making those same mistakes or those same failures or wasting time in certain areas that I could be more productive in others that actually worked. When it comes to failure, definitely listen to yourself and listen to the failure and, and have an open ear to it so that uh, you won't have to make the same mistakes again. And that's where I've been with it. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or a, an artist or maybe a creative person in some way, shape or form. Heck, even a musician for that matter, if they're creative. Mm -hmm. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think it's really important to listen to the younger generation and see where they're coming from and keep an ear to the ground when it comes to what struggles they're personally dealing with in this current generation. I'm I'm pretty young myself, um, but I see people that are younger than myself deal with new issues and new problems and new struggles that I didn't have to deal with. And so the cultural landscape kind of keeps shifting with every generation. I think it's important to keep informed. Don't just throw the younger generation by the wayside, but create art and just create for the next generation so that you have something to leave when, when you're gone for them so that they can, you know, learn from it and be entertained by it, but also be inspired by it. Give them something that's meaningful so that they're able to do the same and hopefully do it better. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And because you're a musician, this should be pretty easy for you. What would its soundtrack be? Wow, that is such a great question. Um, the title would be, man, man, that's so hard. Um, the title would be something, Finding Meaning uh, would be like the title, Finding Meaning. The soundtrack would most likely be Billy Joel's The Stranger. Well, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular interview on Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you, Nander, for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I love being here. It was a great time. How can we support you? Where can we find you on social media? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Nandor Fox Schaefer. Uh, you can also find me um, on Twitter at Nandor Fox and Instagram at Nandor Fox Schaefer. Usually only use those three main uh, social media profiles. So definitely follow me on there. Please back Manchild on Kickstarter and you can find all of my books on the Kickstarter as well. There's actually a reward where you can get all of my previous uh, published works on there. Yeah, that would be the the... 
best way to support me is supporting the Kickstarter. I would definitely point people to my YouTube channel, which is Foxhole Comics. That's my YouTube channel. So you can just type that in on YouTube and I do uh, live streams and I also post uh, videos about comics I'm reading and different top topics that are interesting to me to share with people. So uh, the Foxhole Comics YouTube, there's also my newsletter, which is uh, foxholecomics.substack.com. My online store, which is uh, foxholecomics.gumroad.com. So you can buy all my books on Gumroad or Amazon. That's basically uh, my main store and newsletter and my YouTube channel. Well, like I said, that, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, that's the word two, not the number two. If it's the number two you, you search for, it's something completely different. And it's actually <laughs> literally called like two old guys talking or something like that. It's just silly. But you can, of course, find this interview on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I am only one person and I can only do so much. Give me a break, which is youtube.com <laughs> forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And of course, support us on our Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash TGT media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. <laughs>